I am uh, David Skeer, and I teach here at Concordia Theological Seminary in the departments of, of uh, Biblical Theology and Systematics. And we are working through the Gospel of Matthew in the three-year series. And the pericope for this Sunday is from the 21st chapter, beginning at verse 23, which we will read first in the English, and then we will take a look at it in the Greek. And when Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you a question. And if you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or from men? And they argued from one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the multitude, for all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority do I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But after a while, afterward, he repented and went. And he went to the second and said the same. I go, sir. But, but he did not go. Which of the two did the, did the will of the Father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For God came to you in the way of righteousness, excuse me, for John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and harlots believed him, and even when you saw it, you did not afterward repent and believe him. This is a remarkable pericope that allows for any number of possibilities of preaching. Now, um, so far as preaching is concerned, and I haven't done one of these things in a couple of months, one of these podcasts, you should by now uh, have gotten into the rhythm. Now, if you've been in the ministry for uh, some time, you already know the rhythm. You, uh, it's uh, doing, studying the Gospels is like dancing. And that um, it might take a little while to get into the rhythm, but once you get into the rhythm, you know how to do it. So this is much easier than the, the, the Gospels, um, the, the, just using the one Gospel series, in which I see absolutely no rhyme or reason into it. Now, uh, this, is, this is a remarkable pericope in any number of ways. It's going to be prepare, uh, preparatory for Matthew 28, and it's going to uh, connect uh, the Sermon on the Mount to this, what's going on here. It says here that Jesus was teaching in the temple. Now, since Jesus was a, a licensed, was a rabbi, he was the licensed to do this kind of thing. And this would be comparable, not so much as Jesus preaching, as we would be preaching, but it's comparable to a Bible class, even though we shouldn't make the distinction. And there was a lar probably a large crowd around him. Now, it's, take a look at that, by the way. Verse 23, it said he was didaskantes. He was teaching. So this was not just a kind of a casual discussion on religion. Rather, he was laying out everything which he had to say, probably the things that we find in the Sermon on the Mount and uh, in the authority of the apostles and the parables. This is what he was doing. That's what he was teaching. It had to be a very serious matter. If we could reconstruct this situation, his popularity was enough reason, was reason enough that the authorities came to uh, hear what he has to say. <laughs> to get a, a personal reminiscence, I remember back in uh, Springfield, 
in my uh, salad days that uh, the administration at times wasn't too happy with, with me. Maybe that's understandable and they would, it would even happen in Fort Wayne. And uh, they would have a student, they would ask a student to take down notes to see if I was teaching something that I shouldn't, shouldn't be teaching. Well, that's that kind of situation. The situation is to trap Jesus. Now when it says there, the Yarkia, when it says the chief priests, I have never understood the reason why this has to be translated the chief priests. Uh, there's no, uh, the word there could easily be chanted that the high priests and the elders of the people came. And this, this was, <coughs> I don't know if you want to bring this up into a, a, a sermon, but there are going to be people in the congregation, well, why not say it, who uh, will be unhappy with, with you. And they're going to be trying to catch you on anything you really say. Well, this is the kind of situation, there's a tension built into that. Now, they ask here basically, uh, ten poia exusia by tauta poises, what do you do these, uh, by, by what authority do you do these things? Who has, who has invited you to do this? Um, so uh, they're not challenging what he says. They're challenging his credentials if he really uh, is it, is it really has the authority to do these things. They're asking for his license and uh, to who and it's set up very nicely. Uh, who tis soy edoken? Who gave to you this authority? Now this is absolutely beautiful because at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the evangelist Matthew gives us the answer to this. He taught them as one who had authority in himself, which indicates that when Jesus preached, he did not cite all kinds of sources. He himself was the word of God and he preached the word of God. And he had came from on himself. And then this anticipates the end of the gospel, Matthew 28, where Jesus says, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Even though this pericope, this section, ends with a question, we're not, we don't know, Jesus does not answer this. The person who was hearing this gospel read will soon know the answer, that Jesus has received this authority from God. Uh, <clears throat> and... Um, I just picked up, uh, it was in the newspaper two days ago, that white Christians are now a minority in the United States. Um, and this presents an entirely different situation than when I entered the, the ministry, and that's 55 years ago. It wasn't a question whether you went to church, but the question is, which church did you go to? Now that question no longer exists. And what this requires here is a more of a forceful, apol uh, apologetic and aggressive approach over against the people we're, we're speaking with. And that is, they don't, God is no longer part of the, uh, God is no longer part of the environment. And you'll notice here, Jesus, by the way, is not too gentle at all. What he does is he takes their question and turns it around. Now this might be <coughs> this might be a lesson in how we are to handle ourselves. In other words, we don't have as pastors and Christians, the lay people too, we don't have to answer every question that people ask especially if the question is asked to entrap us in something or for us to say something about ourselves which will be used against us. Now, of course, what had happened by now, the reason the antagonism uh, has come up to this question is they know very well that Jesus has claimed to be divine 
and that he, is, he claims to be the spokesman for God. And if that should be true, then the, I would like to translate that, that phrase to high priest. Uh, this is playing uh, at the upper ranks. This is not playing on the lower ranks. They know, it'll be that, they know that uh, their ministry, their service in the temple will come to an end. This all hangs together. Because Jesus has already claimed to be the temple of God. And if he is the temple of God, then these people are not the priests in the temple. If he's the word of God, then these other people, whatever religion they're teaching, is not the true religion. And so what Jesus does, he, Jesus must have been, and I think it's perfectly okay to say this, uh, Jesus must have been uh, somewhat of a belligerent teacher. And uh, he lets the, the good, the, the teacher, a teacher in his, in his best form is when he lets the students, the audience, come to conclusions rather than make, rather than simply laying out a number of conclusions. So here comes, the, Jesus says, okay, I will engage in theological discussion. Now, I've had an opportunity, but not too much, to engage in theological discussion with unbelievers and with other Christians. And uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity because it forces you to um, articulate your faith in a way that it, it is, it's understandable to people. So within this environment, it says here, the answer that Jesus says, he says, he says, I'll make a deal. I'll answer your question, but first you'll have to answer my, mine. It's not, a, it's not a proposition that his uh, opponents could turn down. And it's an either all question, it's A or B. Take a look at verse 25. The baptism of John, whence was it? Boy, I don't like that translation. Why don't we just say, where did the baptism of John come from? A, did it come from heaven? Or did it come from men? Which means this. Was John sent by God? Or really did he adopt the office of a prophet by himself? And then comes the word at the end. D.A. Lagunzantas. And they discussed among themselves. That's really a beautiful word. You know, that word is used by, uh, of the disciples. Uh, when Jesus asks them a question, they go into a huddle. And, and what shall we say? It's been a long time since I watched one of these game shows on television where they have college students and they have to come up with an answer and they have to come up with a corporate answer. I just love that. So, and they're generally from relatively prestigious colleges out east. It's, this is, that's what they said. They went into a corner. Now, uh, this was not just a fly-by-night thing out there on the farm. They got together and said, what is the possible answer? And somehow, now I don't know how the, the, the evangelists know that, they realize they've been trapped. For if we say, ex huranu, from heaven, then they'll say, why didn't you believe him? If we say, from men, we fear the crowd, for Pontus, all indeed, as a prophet, held John. They all regarded him as a prophet. Um, I think we want to say a couple of good words about John the Baptist. I think the people do like that for this reason. John, John is the prominent figure in Advent, which is coming up. And we Lutherans do not, to the best of my experience, uh, do not have any churches named after John the Baptist. And um, a very important person from this point of view. He, he is the one who reveals the entire will of God. He is the one who takes the entire Old Testament and pinnacles it or points it to Jesus, all of it. He is the one, he brings the Old Testament to conclusion. There is nothing in the Old Testament that does not filter through the preaching of John the Baptist onto Jesus. So when Jesus is revealed as the Christ, but the people who have listened to John the Baptist know who it is. 
Now comes the question, the people believe the preaching of John the Baptist, but the real problem is, is that they cannot grip that Jesus is the, that Jesus is the one upon whom this all focuses. Now, this, this is the problem that our Jewish friends have. Now, most Jews, by the way, are not observant Jews. They, are, they look upon Judaism as an ethnicity, as a club, and they're very, they're very concentrated on themselves and being Jewish. But they do have the Old Testament. And uh, I think this has to be brought out in this kind of sermon, that they are close to the kingdom of God, but they do not have it. And then comes in verse 27, answering Jesus, they said, we do not know. Uh, and, he said to, and he said to them, neither do I tell you by what exousia I, will, <coughs> I do these things. Now the answer is totally brilliant. Now the... Uh, there's something Socratic about Jesus, Socrates-like, and that uh, he lets the people, uh, he, he, he lets the question hang by, by whose authority he does that. <clears throat> now, uh, we can get into a direct situation with um, pastors in every situation, and that is by what, uh, if you, you want to do it, I think it's perfectly okay. By what authority does the pastor, the person who claims to be the pastor, do this? As it. And in, in our system, uh, the church has given him the authority to do it, specifically the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. <clears throat> now at this point here, this is a throwback to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. Because even though the answer for by what authority Jesus do these, does these things is not given here, it's already been given for everybody who has been reading the gospel or hearing the gospel read because the Sermon on the Mount ends, he spoke as one who had authority in himself. So it isn't that the, re the hearer or the reader of this gospel is at a loss. Uh, the, question, the question has already been answered at the end of the seventh chapter. And the person who is hearing the gospel read knows from the beginning that Jesus has the authority of God. And then this also anticipates the conclusion of the gospel where Jesus says, after the resurrection, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now there, the reference, by the way, is not authority in the sense of power. It's authority in the sense of teaching that everything that God wants to reveal will be revealed through him. And uh, uh, there's a slight difference at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has this authority from God. I mean, he has it within himself. And here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he has it from within himself. <clears throat> now, the concluding verses, which may be, which are optional, is a parable, and it seems um, it seems likely that it followed directly on what was said. Now we do not know on what day Jesus preached certain things, um, but the uh, the discourses in the final chapters of Matthew certainly do fit the last week of his life, because now what he does he takes the lead and tells this parable. And um, the parable is, uh, is the parable is that man has two sons and he asks one son to go and work. And the guy says, okay, and he doesn't. He asks the other son to go and work. He says, no, I'm not gonna do it. And he goes in and do it. I like this very much because I almost think, you <laughs> Both, both, of these sons are, both of these sons are maneuvering around. And uh, I think if a person has children, he can better understand this. This is almost a parable. You know, it doesn't have to do with Christianity at all. 
there are some people who want to make sure that when there's a job to be done, they, vo they volunteer right up, right up front. But uh, when the moment comes for them to do anything, they're not there. <laughs> it almost sounds like setting up tables and chairs for a church supper. All of a sudden, the people disappear. We go to the church in the summertime in the Poconos, and Pastor Rickard came about 10 years ago. And he drove his, uh, he, he drove a rental hall, rental, rented a truck, and drive it out from far away. And after the church service, he asked the volunteers to come. Oh, that was a big cry, crowd, cry, cry of congregation. Of course, they, when it had to be done, they weren't there. <laughs> I know this is this is a this is a per, this is a very good description of what life is like. Not not just in the church, but any place. Some guys are really slick and don't do anything at all. Then there's the other guy. There's the other son who uh, says he's not going to do it. I like that guy. He's probably a Lutheran because we Lutherans have a good sense of guilt. We say we're not going to do things, but we overcome by guilt, and we eventually do it. And um, this also is in preparation for the end of the gospel. Because at the end of the gospel, it doesn't say go and make disciples out of Jews and Gentiles. By the way, we shouldn't translate it nations. It should be Gentiles. Or a variety of peoples with no one, no one peop not one people having it over, over the other. And uh, we already, this, is already, this, this, will, will, this will be described beautifully at the end of the gospel. And one of the things that strikes me, because we're getting very close to the anniversary of the Reformation celebration, and that is, we Lutherans have, we're a pretty substantial church in the United States. We come in after Baptists and Methodists. Obviously, we come in, we're not even close to the Catholics, but we don't even, we don't even play that kind of a game. And we're dwindling. And really, the focal point of the uh, of the Reformation, of the Lutherans, is no longer in the North America, but it's already shifted to the South, specifically to, to Africa. So this is a parable that has application uh, today, but in a different context. God is not a respecter of people. And uh, the, the world does change, and God chooses one people. And now, the, uh, if you've taken a trip to Germany in celebration of the Reformation, you've already discovered uh, that the uh, Lutheran church there barely, barely exists, and barely exists. Well, actually, for these pericopes, you have any number of ways in which you can develop it. You certainly can develop it in this sense, that the, that the pastors, the people, should from time to time take an aggressive approach to the enemies of the gospel. There is no reason to be wallflowers. There's no reason to be sitting on the side. There's no reason not to take an active issue, uh, an active things and issues that are confronting us today. And you know what the issues are. People aren't getting married anymore at the same rate. They're aborting, they're killing their unborn children. Being a male or a female doesn't really matter. Are these things really part of the proclamation of the church? They certainly are. And this might be the Sunday in which you want to take up some ticklish issues. Well, thank you very much for, for, for participating in this study of the gospel, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much.